Welcome to Women Empowered Wednesdays, where we gather to talk about all things women empowered. Internal self-defense, external self-defense, and everything that combines. Mm -hmm. I'm Eve Gracie, this is Victoria Gracie. For those of you who are first joining us, most of you know who, us, who we are, but um, <laughs> we're excited. Today is an interesting topic. It's one that comes up so much for us. So people always ask, every time we do a self-defense video, every time we demonstrate different techniques for different scenarios, the question always comes up, well, what if there's a weapon? Mm. And it's a good question because the reality is that weapons are part of our life, especially here in the United States. Um, they exist and people may use a weapon in terms of, especially when it comes to an assault um, or anytime someone's trying to basically, you know, harm us, a weapon could be part of the equation. Yeah, and we wanna validate that in America, we've also normalized this idea of bad guys with weapons with a lot of movies. So a lot of the movies have almost upplayed this scary moment and we try to think how scary can we make it make it scarier have them have a weapon chasing you in a dark alley by yourself <gasps> ah but we also want to bring some honesty and reality to the statistics sure and um, those are that less than one third of assaults especially sexual assaults that are carried out uh, against women less than one third of those are carried out with a weapon a deadly weapon so yes, it does happen. Yes, it can happen. Um, yes, it is yes, scary. It is a scary, yes, it is a real threat, but it actually is not the most common way these assaults are carried out. So we just wanted to remind you of that. Uh, the other thing is that when it comes to weapons, the truth of the matter is, especially specifically firearms, if somebody were to walk in here right now and all they wanted to do was end my life, right? They could walk in here and they could pull a firearm and they could shoot it and I would have no defense against that, unless I happen to have my firearm right next to me and I happen to pull it out faster, right? Yeah, one of the benefits of weapons is distance ability, that they can, from a far away place, end our life. Yeah, so we're not gonna focus so much on the self-defense of, of that aspect, right? Because it, that, that could hurt anyone, right? If, if someone were to pull a weapon and I don't have something to um, you know, physically defend myself against in that exact scenario, in that exact time, then, somebody can end your life. That's how they work, right? That's yeah. why they're so deadly and so effective. Um, what we're gonna focus on today more is how this carries out for often, uh, so often for women, and uh, or even men, actually, which is that people are using a weapon as a means of intimidation to accomplish something else, right? So that something else might be a mugging, it might be something that they wanna get from you, um, it might be a sexual assault, it might be a slew of other things that then lead to somebody's life ending. Right, so we're gonna focus specifically on those types of scenarios uh, because these are the ones that are scariest and these are the ones that we actually have tools against, not just some you know, random person comes in. Now there are active um, shooter uh, defense, you know, there's courses on that. Uh, I know Henner and Hedon have put out videos about that as well. So you know, with weapons, there's, there's even so many different areas to focus on within the weapon discussion. So today for us, we're gonna focus specifically on somebody is using a weapon as a means to intimidate us into something else that they want. Okay, that's what we're gonna talk about. And it's important to look at the subtleties between when weapons are brought into the idea of jujitsu. So jujitsu has been, as we've discussed either in the previous weeks or if you happen to do our Women Empowered course, we detail a bunch of techniques that help you use jujitsu as a reliable form of escape and self-defense. And with jujitsu, it is in fact uh, a lethal ability to engage with someone else, but right. things change with a weapon. They do, and a, a huge part of jujitsu relies on what we call distance management. So it's the idea that we either wanna be all the way away from us where they can't hurt us, right? Or we wanna be so close that they can't effectively strike us. And we have, actually, there's um, another one on YouTube that Henner and I just did called Punch Block Series, which explores this in great detail. And this was a free seminar that we did two weekends ago. So you can check that out to learn more about that concept. However, the truth is, is that when a weapon is brought into the equation, that all can change, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna wanna pull somebody in close to me if I know that they have a weapon, right? So jujitsu with a weapon, jujitsu without a weapon, or self-defense with a weapon, self-defense without a weapon, those are two different things, and that's why we want to um, really focus on the differences there of what, what things we should take into consideration when a weapon is brought into the equation. Uh, so I think we should start with the first rule, okay? There's gonna be four rules that we discussed today. The very first rule, and the most important one, and to be honest, the one that you are most likely, statistically, going to need. It's so important, you guys, and it's the hardest one, okay? But also the easiest one, in some <laughs> ways. 
which is that if somebody uses a weapon to intimidate you into getting something from you, right? If they use a weapon and they are trying to take something material from you, it's your purse, it's your wallet, you're at an ATM, they want cash, it's your new iPhone 11 Pro, God forbid, okay? <laughs> Whatever it is, something material, the easiest defense to that is to give them what they want. And our husbands who are black belts and who could literally kill any person that walks in, into any room with their bare hands um, would do the same yep. thing, right? This is a universal rule that is the number one way, again, we're talking self-defense, defense, simply self-defense. Yep. If somebody wants something physical, those things can be replaced. Now that's a hard thing to hear because you go, no, 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 that's my, I should, you know, I have to fight for, for what's mine. Now you can just know that that will put you at a higher risk because we don't know anything about these people. All we know is that they're desperate, right? If somebody is desperate enough to pull out a weapon and say, yeah. give me this or give me that, uh, whatever it might be, that that person is not somebody I want to take my chances with in terms of, you know, trying to be the hero and trying to save my new phone that I just bought, right? That is where you go, you want it? And you chuck it as far as you can, maybe. Maybe whatever it is, you give it to them, you throw it in the opposite direction, and you run to safety. That is rule number one when it comes to weapons, and it's the most common way that weapons are used in muggings. Now, rule number two. If you are intimidated and being forced into isolation, do everything possible not to go. Because the, the chances are, if they're going to do something in public, if they're going to try to kill you in public, they're definitely gonna kill you in private. So there is no negotiating there. We wanna keep it in public because there's a greater risk, or sorry, a greater chance of intervention. And that's what we're hoping for. When it comes to any kind of weapon altercation, the more we can have other people see you or get involved, the greater chance you have of staying alive. So don't go into isolation at all costs. And we can talk about a lot of the chaos that we can bring, the noise that we can bring. Mm -hmm. Again, if they're gonna intimidate you, great. Let them hurt me right here where at least my body can be found, I can be injured and still be helped. But once we're in a car, once we're in a dark alley or in a room somewhere off in the no man's land, it's very, the, 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 just the numbers decrease on finding you and keeping you safe. Yeah, so our survival chances go way down once we're isolated. So the basics of this is don't let somebody intimidate you into isolation. Now, that being said, that's easy to say as we're sitting here talking and sure. to say, hey, if somebody holds a knife to your throat and says, do as I say, or I won't hurt you, right? It's very, you could see how that would be hard in that moment to do anything other than what they say. Cause the logic is, well, maybe if I do what they say, they actually won't hurt me, right? We always we kind of default to truth when it comes to people telling us things. Mm. So, but the question is that presumes integrity, right? The fact that we're saying, oh, they're actually going to do what they say. That presumes some form of integrity that this person has, yeah. that they actually won't hurt us if we do what they say. Now, how can we presume integrity with someone who's holding a knife to our throat or a gun to our head? That doesn't make sense. So it's easy to think about when we're not in a situation. And that's why these conversations are so important to have ahead of time is that we have to strategize this and know that it is we have much higher rates, uh, chances of survival if we were to try to just flee and get away if somebody has a weapon, right? Now let's say that maybe in that exact moment you didn't feel safe being able to fight it off or run away. The objective still must be, even if they you know, get you into a car or into a situation, the objective must be wait for that quick opportunity where the weapon is not a threat and then get out of the situation. So um, the we can't stress this enough and this this goes with with a weapon or without a weapon but the goal is always to never leave the primary location right especially if that location is in public because our chances of survival or chances of survivor intervention of a bystander intervention goes way up in that situation and i think that might be an emotionally difficult for a lot of us because we think man if i just do what they say maybe they'll leave me alone maybe mm -hmm. maybe i'll get out okay I, i'm gonna listen to them and also this is a scary piece of machinery for many of us if you hold this to me, I'm, I am likely to do what you say. Not just to save my own life, but maybe any danger around me. So we want to get a little bit comfortable with the idea that this is an intimidating factor. And even this, the knife, is an intimidating factor. Mm -hmm. But we have to understand how can we, right now, in a safe situation, reprogram our mind to do something different than we would have otherwise prior to knowing this information. Yeah, and this is 
This is advice given by law enforcement, and these are statistically backed you know, uh, assumptions, which is that the chances of survival, people's survival rate goes way down once they are in isolation. And, and the idea is that if somebody is going to kill you in public, then mm. we're gonna kill you in private too, right? Ooh. Somebody's really kind of decided they're either capable of killing somebody or they're not. And it's likely that they already made up their mind about what that was going to look like, you know, yeah. not always, but it's very possible. So just remembering that, um, you know, in that situation, do everything you can not to go. Okay. That's rule number two. Rule number three is now the situation may get worse. So maybe we are in isolation and maybe help is not anywhere near. Either we already got there prior to being intimidated there, or we were People intimidated already- enough to get there and that's okay. Or maybe we were already in isolation. Maybe Correct. we were in our homes and then somebody, it's, a, it's an in. intruder, yeah. right? So any situation where help is not readily available or escape is not your immediate option and they're using a weapon, okay? And this is where, again, the, the kind of normal ideas of jujitsu and self-defense w- won't always be able to apply. I can't just go to stage one with somebody who has a weapon, right? I actually now, the, the number one consideration once you're there is everything is about gaining compliance, okay? So this is where we put our acting skills to use, if we have mm-hmm. any. Uh, we basically have to go, we, we pretend, right? That's the key word. We're pretending to go along with whatever it is that they want with the objective of one thing, which is to identify an opportunity of escape. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that looks like in a moment. But the first thing is just basically for this phase three, right? Or for, for this or for this third, third rule, right? Which is you're already in isolation. Somebody has a weapon, whatever we can do, whatever we can say to get them to put the weapon down, negotiate, 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 whatever you can be in compliance, make them feel like they don't need the weapon. Tell them, please, you don't need the weapon. I'm very scared. I have a family. I'll do whatever you want. Just please put the weapon down. Yes. And a lot of the reasons, yeah, yeah, a lot of the reasons why they use these intimidation factors is a lot of these people gain um, almost a high off the power of creating and instilling fear in you. And if you could elicit that fear without it, like, I don't even need the gun. You're scary enough as it is. Then like, oh, I'm going to do what you want. You don't even perfect. need the weapon. Bye. I'm game. Whatever yeah. you have, have planned, I'll go along Show with. them that their power is working. Them alone without the weapon can, can intimidate you enough. And again, we're acting here. This is a difficult thing to say, but it, we have to pretend to a place of safety. That's right. So feigning compliance and getting them to put the weapon down. Once the weapon is away, then we have all of jujitsu, we have all of our other techniques, we have all these other opportunities um, to escape and to use you know, other self-defense techniques that we've learned over time, or if you haven't learned yet, you can, um, but our chances of survival go way up when the weapon is out. So if we can get them to put the weapon down, great. Okay, That is a, that kind of third uh, scenario or third rule. Mm. Now. It's getting progressively worse. You can see that this is going to the dark place, right? Yeah. So now, worst case scenario, they don't put the weapon down. And And you're in isolation with them. And you're in isolation. Now, again, now we're talking about a scenario where somebody is potentially using a weapon uh, to, um, you know, to, again, intimidate you into something that you may not be willing to give. Or to do. Or to do. And now we're in that situation. And I do want to... um, kind of warn you, we're, we're gonna basically create some scenarios right now with a weapon. So a little bit of a, of a trigger warning for people who this might be um, an alarming situation to kind of watch, but I guarantee you I'm gonna get out. Okay, the bad guy's gonna win. I mean, the bad guy's gonna, 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 <laughs> the bad guy's guy's gonna win. win. The good guy's gonna win in this situation, okay? And it can be a triggering situation to just even watch our positions, let alone include a weapon. So if, if this is something that is um, triggering for you or you haven't been exposed to, and have a trauma passed with, just give yourself some grace here. Feel free to look away, maybe listen to what we're saying, and then maybe watch later once you've grounded yourself a little bit. Yes, these are fake weapons. This is a rubber knife. This is a rubber gun. It's yellow. <laughs> it's still pretty heavy, so it probably do some damage if you hit somebody with yes. it, but that's about it, okay? So um, we're gonna demonstrate with these weapons. Basically now we're in a situation where we are, we are in isolation. We are not willing or willing to give or do whatever it is that they have planned and we wanna break their arm and take the weapon and then use it against them. And that's, then get to safety. That, that's rule number four, okay? Yeah. So let's take a look at that. So the scenario specifically that we're gonna talk about is um, Which a position like called the guard. We'll start with the knife here. Perfect. So a position called the guard, which basically means that I'm on my back and 
um, the, the bad guy is basically in between my legs here. This is called the guard position, okay? Now, for most women, this seems like worst case scenario, right? Especially in a sexual assault situation. However, in jujitsu, this is actually a very powerful position because I have all kinds of tools that I can use with my arm, my hands, and my legs. And we're gonna see what that might look like. So we're gonna start with a situation where assuming that now the knife is in my throat. Okay? Well, this is the threat position where a bad guy is only using this as a threat here. And we don't know whether they'll go forward with this or not. So she has to learn how to protect her neck and move forward with the defense. So first, I'm always, of course, I'm gonna feign compliance. Please, please put the weapon down. You don't need it. I'll do whatever you want. I have a family at home. I'm very scared. Please. And then we go up here. Okay, so I break the arm, drop the weapon. Ah, here. And now I can use it. Stab, stab, stab. And the arm is broken. Ah. She's back. I get up in base with the weapon in hand. Okay. So let's take a look at that again, but slower. All right. We're going to start actually, let's change the angle here so they can see. So we're going to do this now in slow, slower motion, step by step, just so you can kind of see what happened there. So the, uh, the knife is across my neck. Again, she's using it to intimidate me. We're in this guard position. Basically what I'm going to do is, uh, I want to get this blade. The first thing I want to do is get it away from my neck. So I do that with a cross grip, pulling it here. Okay. So that's the first element of this cross grip. I'm going to brace her shoulder here, foot goes on her hip and then watch the angle I create as I bite high in her armpit. The leg comes around and now look at where the weapon is, right? It's away from my face. And what's happening here is that by pulling my heels down and lifting my hips up, I can break her elbow. She's okay? isolating my arm on this side and using her hips to hyperextend right here on my elbow. Mm -hmm. So basically if I wasn't pinning it to my, to my chest, it would look like this. Okay. So I'd be doing that with my hips, but I'd be holding her wrist to my chest, which would hyperextend the elbow here. And okay? she uses this to force me to drop the weapon while still pushing through my elbow. Mm -hmm. So I have control of her here and I would break the arm no matter what. But if they don't, for some reason, drop the weapon, you can remind them, drop the weapon, and they go here. Now, I wanna take my top arm. So I have a stronger control over this arm. You don't wanna let this go. Right, so we still wanna control this here. So with the opposing arm, elbow tight to my rib, and now the other hand can come across, okay? And now from here, I can use the weapon against her, right? She so opens up here. her knee to create an access point to my neck, and she uses the knife on my neck. Right here, okay? And now I can push her away. Look, I put my, push my, um, just be careful of that <laughs> fireplace behind you. <laughs> Launch them into the fireplace, okay? Do that. <laughs> and then here, I'll go ahead and wait, maybe sit that way here. And now I can get up in base. Look, I get up here. The most important thing is what? Always bring the weapon with you, okay? Yes. <laughs> Don't drop the weapon. If you've ever seen any scary movie ever, <laughs> no, not to drop the weapon. Bring it with you. Okay? There's a I lot we learned from scary movies, and that's what not to do. Never run upstairs if a scary guy comes in, yes. <laughs> and never leave the weapon there for them to re-engage with it and use it against you. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna. Um, I showed you it with a knife. We're gonna show it with a gun too. It's very it's the same position. Now, just to be clear, again, this is a very specific scenario where the hand is somewhere near my neck or throat or head, right? And it would be the same thing with the weapon, right? If the weapon is here close to my neck, close to my head, um, then this is an option. It's called the arm lock and we're gonna see it again, right? So I'm gonna do it slow again, but just it, now it's the context of the weapon. Now the benefit of the, of the weapon, of, I'm sorry, of a firearm in a situation, instead of grabbing her wrist, I can actually grab the barrel, right? So I can make sure that that, the line of sight is no longer aligned with my face. Now this would have to happen so quickly, right? Yes. Everything happens at once, but I want to show you in a step-by-step -step so that we can kind of see this here. Yes, and one thing that's important to note here, as she the, the point is to deflect the barrel in case that it still might shoot. She's putting it to the side of her head so it doesn't go through her head. For the record as well, while we've never been in this position personally, we do know that shooting right here will cause some discombobulation because this, if it's still shot here, it will still be ringing in your ear and thus your head. So know that this can a little bit be jarring. Mm -hmm. So here, so I can use the, I can, I can take the barrel, right? First, deflect. Deflect here, the foot goes on the hip. And now watch this angle as I bite her, um, her armpit. So I'm gonna show you Look that Look how her time. hips go up and bite high. Mm -hmm. So as I, uh, again, I deflect the barrel, this comes in here, and then I get this angle. And then I bring the other leg around, around her neck, yeah. okay? And now again, the barrel is still out of, out of reach. And I'm always focusing on the weapon here, right? That's the only focus. Breaking her arm, right? I break the arm, I can take the weapon here. And then after I can, I can push her back. And now from here, I can shoot. 
right? So now I'm in this position where I can now use the weapon safely, I have a distance. Um, I don't want her to be too close to the weapon for too long from that position. So that's the difference between the knife and the gun, is that the knife I can use while she's in close quarters. With the gun I, or the firearm, I don't want to be in close quarters grappling with a firearm, right? So I want to get her back after I've broken her arm, of course, and then I can shrimp out if I need to, get my hips out, and now I'm here, right? So I can use it, and then worst case scenario, if the weapon jams or something else happens, at you, let's say she comes back at me, right? I can be here, right? So now I'm blocking her hips, we call it stage four, but she can't reach the firearm from here, right? So I can keep this out of range, and, um, and then there's other things I can do from here, right? I can up kick, I can keep her back, but the key thing is not allowing her to get uh, a hold of this weapon again, okay? So that is, and we're, we're giving you kind of a, a quick breakdown of these techniques, but these are in much more detail on gracieuniversity.com, lesson number 18 in the Women Empowered Program. So you can watch this over and over again. You can learn all the techniques, um, learn how to do this with a partner. We got you covered for that. So a lot of things that she briefed here, and again, goes into deep detail on online, but one thing I wanted to mention here is that she gave a quick sequence of how the scenario could go. Honestly, it's an optimal, choreographed, here's how this would go down. It's very likely that with weapons or without weapons, there is a bit more struggle in between. It feels like it can go faster than a movie scene. And we're also not guaranteed when, when introducing this weapon that it won't get jammed, that you'll even know how to use it. And we'll talk about that in a few more moments. But before we do that, we want to talk about some of the ethical dilemmas that might come through. Well, let's this. talk about the other, show the oh, other okay. technique first. And then, yeah, we'll show you kind of two different scenarios. And then we'll just talk about other elements that come into play here. That, yes. you know, we're going to teach you the technique, but there's other little things to consider when we're thinking about defending ourselves against weapons. So what we, what we had originally showed you is when that weapon was in my neck, right? Now, but what if I'm chill? What if I'm just a bad guy who has a plan? But I'm sitting here and I want to intimidate her, but I'm not up on her neck. I'm just relaxed here. I'm, I'm talking to her. I'm trying to show my power with the weapon, but I'm not engaging with it to the point of attack yet. So look at the location of the weapon. It's down low, okay? It's just down low on the ground. She's got it ready to use if she you know, wanted to. It's just kind of there. We call okay? it a little more of a subtle intimidation versus the overt right. intimidation. Exactly. So we're here, same thing. I'm gonna try to negotiate. I'm gonna try to feign compliance. Please put the weapon down. I'm very scared. I'll do whatever you want. Mm -mm. I promise I'll do whatever you want. Mm -mm. And we're mm -mm. It's called the kimura technique, okay? So I break the arm first. Break the arm, drop the weapon. And now from here I use the top arm. And, okay, stab, stab, stab. And now we're out, okay? I can get up and base with the weapon in hand. Cool? Let's look at that again. It's called the kimura technique. So what, what did you notice about both of these techniques? Two things, right? The focus is not the weapon. It's not that I'm going after the weapon. The focus is the arm that's controlling the weapon. The focus is the control of the bad guy, period. Right, so we're, whatever's holding the weapon, the arm that's holding the weapon, that's what we want to control. And then after we gain control of that body part, then we can take the weapon from them and use it against them. So let's look at this here. So again, I'm in a bad guy, relaxed position where I'm not completely in here. I'm relaxed and almost intimidating, negotiating. Mm -hmm. So same thing, we use negotiation tactics. And look at where my hands are. This is like, hey, I'm negotiating, but they're ready. They're ready to act if I need to, okay? So I'm gonna break this down a little bit slower so we can see these in detail. So the first thing is I'm gonna grab the wrist, okay? C grip, I grab the wrist. Now her first direction she's likely gonna go in is in. So that arm needs to be extended, okay? So I grab the wrist and then immediately I follow up and I hug her arm. Now she tries to pull, retract her arm, she can't. Mm. Okay, so now from here I can push back. And then the key is this, look, I want her arm bent at a 90 degree angle, okay? Now using my feet on her leg, um, or even stepping over her leg here, I'm gonna get my hips out and face her. So hip, shoulder, hip, shoulder, and now we're here. And she's controlling my whole body, so I can't get up or get out. Mm -hmm. So here we call this kind of like a side guard position where my legs are around her torso. Again, her arm is bent 90 degrees. And now ultimately what I would do is bend in this way and she drops, she's tapping right now, okay? Because it hurts. So what this would look like, so right now she drops the weapon, right? If she does, watch this, I use my top arm, okay? So there's one that's kind of entangled with her arm. I use my top arm to grab the weapon here. So she's still interlaced and still controlling me while getting a weapon in right. her yeah, this, this leg can kind of control the arm, this one has the weapon, and then we can use it here, okay? We can use it here, and then I can get out from underneath her. And as I push, here we go, I can shrimp out, I can get up, get up and base safely. 
All right. Now let's show that one more time. A couple more maybe details to see. Do you want to turn? Or no? Yeah, let's go this angle a little bit so you can see, and then we'll switch around so you can see the other side. So as I look, I have a C grip here on the wrist, okay? And notice how I move my body away. I do that so that that arm is stiff. If it's bent, now it's arm, arm strength versus arm strength, and I don't want to fight that battle, okay? So stiff arm, and then I sit right up, okay? I'm hugging the back of our arm. Look, it comes up and over. It swims through. Now I want you to notice, look, something. C grip, and then as soon as I come in, look, I switch to double monkey grips here. This is a really strong control on their wrist. Mm -hmm. And now from here, I push off of my feet, I lift my hips and I pull her on top of me, keeping this arm close to her back. Okay, 90 degrees. Again, I want her arm bent. And now using my foot, look, instead of out here, if I, if I don't trap this leg, she could step back over and then kind of go to the side mount or mount and I would lose the position. So I want to keep this controlled here. So my foot's on the inside. Now watch as I angle my hips out, hips, shoulders. I want to face her slightly. Now let's turn everything around slightly just so we, they can see this angle. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so now we're here, right? So here again, I've got my feet crossed around her torso. Now I'm gonna let go just so you guys can see, but this is the angle that I would be pulling at. Watch. Boom! Ah, that's the rip I would be doing on her on her uh, shoulder right here. So it's a shoulder lock. And not only can it destroy the shoulder, it can actually even destroy the elbow as well. Boom! That's the angle. Okay, so that's what I'm doing to the arm to make her let go, to cause excruciating pain. Right, and to kind of negotiate this this weapon and right? to get the weapon back in your to position. get the weapon back in my position so so again here drop the weapon right if they don't again i can use this top leg look i control her top arm and now the other the top hand comes in grabs the weapon here and now i can use it okay stab 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 and now look i step my foot off because assuming that the 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 uh, person has been taken care of and now i can push off of their body and i can get up in base here cool so these are two, again, two techniques. One's called the arm lock from the guard. The other is called the Kimura technique. Now these are both from the same kind of scenario, which is honestly worst case scenario. This is like the end of the, of the road. They're using this as a, mo as a means for intimidation. And we're at a point where we say, nope, no longer. Okay, I want to get this weapon back. I want to use it against you. But like Victoria mentioned earlier, you know, there is a... You know, there, there may be an ethical dilemma for some people. For others, maybe it's very black and white. But one thing that we want to, you know, to address is that in these types of situations where it's life or death, right, what, what is shown is that whoever is more committed to survival is going to survive, yeah. okay? And what that might mean is whoever is more willing to do what it takes to survive will survive. And I think you kind of know what I mean, meaning that whoever is willing, whatever it takes, meaning if I have to kill somebody else, if I have to end their life for me to survive, and that's what I have to do in that moment, I will do it. Wait a minute. Yeah. I already know what so many of you are thinking. And I say that because I think it as well. Never in my life did I think I want to kill someone. I want to use a firearm against someone. I want to stab someone to death. I don't wake up thinking that. I don't go to sleep Hopefully thinking that. Nobody, <laughs> you know, nobody watching this thinks that. Uh, but I'm, but I'm yeah. saying this because it, it is and it was an interesting battle for my mind and my heart connection and wh whatever thing you'd like to call your deity, your God, your universe. This is a very ethical dilemma for many people because it's not likely that you want to harm people. And yet here you are in a position where it's your life versus theirs. And I want to validate the idea that it might be difficult for you to look at a weapon and say, I'm going to use this against someone, whether or not you're trained in this, what, a knife, and this person is here with you, and you're so focused on getting to safety that you're like, I'm not going to stab them. I, I don't want to hurt anyone. I just want to be alive. I just want to be okay. But here's what I want you to consider. It might be a life versus life situation. It might be that if you don't take their life, you will not live. And that's why when we have this discussion, we're not telling you what to do, although we do have some opinions. Mm -hmm. What we're asking you to do is sit with yourself before it happens, before you're put into a position of high anxiety, high threat, high stakes, to sit with yourself and know, right now, if I had to choose my life or an attacker's life against me in an isolated situation where there's weapons involved, 
would I be willing to and at what cost and am I willing to learn how to do it to ensure my own safety that I get back to my family or myself mm -hmm. in time. And I think what's interesting about this is that sometimes, yeah, people may not identify as like, well, I'm not a fighter or I could never do that if yep. it came to that situation. But then you say, okay, imagine if, you know, someone you love, right? Mm -hmm is on the other side of that or you had to do it to save somebody you love what's so interesting is that women specifically yeah. a lot of times they say oh i'll do whatever it takes to save my child that i have to do this. this right so that so whatever kind of um frame of thought you need to you need to have in terms of when it comes to survival it's not just about you it's about the people that love you and that includes your children it includes your parents it includes your brothers and sisters it includes all the people in your life so I would love it to, if you got to a place where you say, I'll fight for me just because it's me and I'm worth fighting for. Yeah. But if you're not even there yet, then talk about who, who will fight for me or who can I fight for? Mm. And that's ultimately what you're doing when you're fighting for yourself. You're fighting for the people that you love. I think what, what turned it for me was, okay, if I'm in this situation and it's a weapon between me and an attacker, the attacker's coming to me and my child is asleep in the next room. If I don't save my life for this, my child's life is next. And that's when I told myself, okay, I gotta learn how to handle weapons and handle the situation. I just gotta be okay to defend myself in, guess what, our reality. We're not saying that this is something that's going to happen to each of you, but this is a reality in the world mm -hmm. that there are people for whatever life and worldly reasons have found that attacking women is a means of living for them. And we, we hope on everything that exists in this world that this doesn't happen to you. But we also know that statistically, it is a reality for many women. And on that note, again, we're talking about the ethical dilemma. We're talking about, can I actually do this? Uh, you know, we, what, we, what we will say is that, you know, it's, everyone, it's their personal choice. Everyone's personal choice, whether they decide to own a firearm or not. You know, yes. that, we have nothing to say about that. That is everyone's personal choice of what they decide. Um, however, it's not always our choice whether a firearm falls into our life, right? In a situation like that, that is not our choice. And so what we recommend is that whether you own a firearm or not doesn't, doesn't matter. However, learning how to safely handle a firearm if one falls in your possession is a tool and a skill that we highly recommend to people. Um, I think the first thing about that, that it does is it takes away, like this is ultimately a machine, right? This is a machine that once you recognize this machine doesn't act by itself, right? It doesn't do anything by itself. Sometimes we feel like that. Like, we fear guns. We Many people I know fear guns. Fear them so much. And once you learn like, oh, actually this is a machine that if I learn how to work it, it works for me. It doesn't work for itself. So learning how to safely handle a weapon can make sure that if it ever falls in your hand, you know how to safely uh, disarm it. You know how to clear it if it's jammed. Uh, you know, you would know how to use it if you need it in that moment. And that is, you know, something that, that if you've never done, it might just be something you think about and going, you know what, at some point, especially, you know, once things open up for wherever you're at, you know, going to a range and just saying, okay, I just want to see what this feels like and learn how just the safety procedures of it. And, um, you know, you will be much more likely to be able this, if it, if, because all the, all the things that we just taught you being able to take the weapon away from somebody after you break their arm, mm. uh, that weapon is still a liability rather than an asset. If we don't know how to use it safely. Right. And if, yeah. if the fight were to continue and they got that firearm back, you know, again, now it, it, it's, it's a liability. So we want to make sure that if it ever falls into our hands, it's only an asset for us. And just understanding some basics of it, just basic safety. Is, um, is, is kind of all we're recommending and something just to, to consider and to think about maybe doing sometime with somebody that you feel safe, with somebody that you wanna learn this with um, and you can leave it at that. How, how, how I feel about that is I, I look at it like changing your relationship with weapons. Some people mm -hmm. have a really um, safe relationship with weapons. It's a machine, I know how to use it, I know they how to They feel very to... comfortable. They're yeah. comfortable. Many other people that I know and I would say the majority of the women I know have a very fear-based relationship with weapons. And anything we have a fear-based relationship with, we have to ask why. Why do I fear this? Why am I giving it power over me? And how, how can I take my power back? And when she talks about learning firearms and deconstructing the fact that it is a piece of metal, I know how to clear it. I know how to turn the safety on and off. 
I know what it means to trigger it. I know how it will shake. I know how it will sound. All this practice and understanding of the weapon will help dissipate some of your fear in the relationship you have with weapons. Now, to be clear, we're not saying going out and start arming yourself with automatic rifles. We're saying understand the machine. We're saying understand how and what this is and how it can be used against you and how to create a better relationship with anything that you fear. Mm -hmm. And that just goes with it, all fears, right? At some point you go, okay, I'm gonna tackle that fear, that thing that scares me. I wanna understand it better. And that's, that's kind of what we're, uh, what we're talking about right now. Um, now the other thing is, is of course, like we said, we cannot tell you what to do in any of these situations. And even those techniques that we, that we uh, discussed, you know, these, there might be scenarios where someone chooses not to use those or, or doesn't feel safe using them. Or even if they, if they uh, you know, fully understand the techniques and have practiced it hundreds of times. Um, however, you know, if somebody were to defend themselves using a weapon that they got, got control of, mm -hmm. it's super important that somebody immediately, whoever were, was to use the weapon, uh, reports it immediately. So to document everything and to make sure that you immediately call authorities, call the police and let them know what happened and, you know, cooperate with that. And it's, it's a, it's, it's just an important thing to consider about this is that, you know, we often think that it would always be the case that it would be very obvious that a woman is defending herself against a man and that if she used it, it would be in self-defense. But there have been cases where that didn't always play out. So just a reminder that if anyone ever did have to use one in self-defense, it's so important to document everything that you can um, to make sure that it is understood, you know, the nature of, of the use of it for self-defense in that case. And this piggybacks any kind of violence against women, any kind of assault that we've talked about in the past, reporting it as immediately as possible, getting and this can feel uncomfortable for many, is getting your body checked out, understanding that you can go to a hospital and have tests done and have samples taken, and this is including with a gun. If you have a weapon, getting that into the hands of the authorities and, and making sure that they know what went down and documenting every piece of this with them will serve you better in the long run. Yeah, and um, you know, that one might say, well, no, that would not but it, especially in the cases of domestic violence, we understand that they're, you know, th we, we can't always assume that, uh, you know, that we don't need to report it. We, we should just always, always report anything that happens, um, any kind of yeah, physical altercation, yeah. especially any with a weapon there. So if you watched all of this, um, it's likely that you're like, but what about, but what about, and how about if, and what about if? A lot of the things that we've talked about this, we offer as continued training on graceuniversity.com and the Women Empowered Program. It happens to be lesson number 18. If you are following online, if you take the program at any one of our CTCs, this class is where we discuss it. And we love talking about this kind of stuff and we're open to any questions and ideas. So if you wanna message us on any of our um, social channels or ask us today, we are opening up a little bit of that right now. Um, and if you wanna continue training. Yeah, if you wanna continue training, um, you can go to gracieschools.com. That's a list of all of our certified training centers, many of which offer this Women Empowered program. In person. In person, and um, obviously many of them are right temporarily, you know. On um, lockdown. On lockdown, but there will be, <laughs> many of them will be opening them up, opening up hopefully soon. Uh, and if that's not an option for you, then going to graceuniversity.com and learning from your home online with somebody that you, um, that you trust and that you wanna share that experience with. Yeah, we would definitely recommend that. Um, let's see, uh, do we have any any questions that came up that are mm. worth? That all worth talking that about. All worth talking about. One of the things that I have to be honest for me that was an interesting um, conversation when we were talking about the ethical dilemma is that I recognize that I had this weird issue with like, who am I to take their life over them taking my life because I had some distorted views of like, well, they need this, I'll, I just give it to them, and if I can't, I guess I, I guess I go with the flow. And sometimes that flow would end in my demise. And so there was some definite like sitting down and journaling that I go, why, why wouldn't I be willing to use a firearm? Why wouldn't I be willing to stab them back? Because I could never imagine stabbing another human. I could never imagine shooting another human. And the thought of doing that um, gave me a little bit of anxiety, actually a lot of it. Hmm. And it was through training, it was through playing with the idea of, oh my gosh, I'm in this position, oh my gosh, my arm is twisted, oh my gosh, my child 
safety, my family's safety in a close proximity might be worth it for me to learn and know this stuff. And I want you to know now, I want you to know now whether or not you'd be willing to pull a trigger, whether or not you'd be willing to fight for your own life. Well, and that's why this is important, just to bring up a conversation before, yeah. a conversation with yourself, not even with somebody else, maybe with somebody else, but just really thinking about this. Because if we wait for the moment to find out how we're going to respond, then chances are we're going to kind of default to our our defaults, whatever yeah. those are for many, fight, flight, or freeze. And for many, it, it might be freeze. And for many, it might, they might say, I might not be able to do that. So having this conversation, even visualizing it to a certain extent, obviously, mm-hmm. um, you know, that can be, that can be challenging for many. Um, and you want to make sure that you're like mentally in a good place to do that, but doing some visualization of how something like this could actually happen. Um, especially when you, in your visualization, disarm this person can use it against them and safely get up. It it actually is very an an empowering experience if you can do that. So, um, you know, that is also a part of all of the kind of combative training that, that we do at Grace University and with Women Empowered. Yeah, so just so that we can recap that rules of engagement real quick first, is if they want something from you, material or otherwise, let it go. Give it to them, let it go. Bye, I throw throw it to them. Throw it and then run in the other direction. Get it out. Okay. And just to be clear, that, will be the hardest one of all of these is you are going to want you and and this is not to say that it's not still a huge violation and that it's not still oh, yeah. like a really hard thing to deal with it's just like oh just give it to them no it would it would come with a lot of like oh someone just violated you and they took something from you and they did that in, in terms of terminate and intimidation but what you shouldn't feel is oh i should have done this or i should have just tried to grab the weapon or i should have ran or i should have no there's no should have would have there it, this is Safety first, your life comes b- before anything material. So we can't stress that one enough. That's why it's rule number one. That's why it's the first one we say. We want to emphasize it again. If they want something material, hand it over to them. Yep. And then if they're intimidating you into isolation, do not go. Do not go. And rule number three is if you are already in isolation and they're using a weapon to intimidate you into doing something, stay in compliance and just try to negotiate the weapon out of the equation so that you have the rest of your self-defense or jujitsu techniques available. And then number four, if it's in there and we're doing it, break it and take it. (laughs) Break the arm, take the weapon, and uh, get to safety. Do not go, negotiate, break it and take it. That's that's the summary, that's the wrap up today. Uh, Thank you guys for joining us. This is, uh, again, a a conversation that is, is, it's worth the time. It's a, it's really important one to understand, even just understanding those, those rules. And again, rule number one could save a lot of us from, um, from harm. And so we, we appreciate you guys joining us today on this conversation about weapon safety. Mm-hmm. Um, we, uh, now have a, a, a landing page for you guys to go to. Cause a lot of people had said, Hey, there's tons of these videos that are, that we've done over, over the last few weeks, um, and more regarding women empowered and people wanting to know where to find these other videos. So if you go to graceuniversity.com slash we gather, W-E-G-A-T-H-E-R, we gather, uh, all of our videos and the past videos that we've done uh, in this style are there. So we encourage you to go check it out and check out some of the older videos if you guys have not yet. Um, For those of my followers, if you're not following, at Women Empowered GJJ yet, there's more of this type of material of self-defense. Go follow us on Instagram and And if you know anyone who would benefit from this video, feel free to share it with them. And we cannot thank you guys enough for joining us here. We really enjoy sitting with you guys. We enjoy hearing all the conversations, your life's journey. We we suck soak it all in and we really ruminate on it. And we're like, how can we learn from this? We want to know your life stories, your experiences, and we gain so much information from sharing these things together. Every week we gather for the benefit of all of us as a whole. And we really are grateful that you join us and we hope to see you again next week. Bye. Enjoy your day.